Well, good morning and welcome to our service on behalf of Dingwall and Strathpeffer and Ferentosh and Rosalis. My name is the Reverend Andrew McLeod and the Assistant Minister up at Tain and Fern Free Church. We're here to worship God. Let us sing together in Psalm 133. Psalm 133, how excellent a thing it is, how pleasant and how good, when brothers dwell in unity and live as brothers should. Let us sing to God's praise. together. Let's pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can sing these words of unity, and we do pray that they are not just words on our lips, but they are deeds that we do, that it is indeed good for us to be together. It is good when brothers and sisters can Worship the Lord with one accord. Lord, we pray that you would be with each and every one who is tuning in to this service today, that you would meet them at the point of their need. As we will see in your word, you met your own mother, Mary, at the point of her deep and grievous need. O oh, gracious God, we echo the words of the psalmist. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. We do not want to pull you down to ourselves, but we want ourselves to be lifted up to you. So, gracious God, may you be with each one of us. Be with our congregations throughout our denomination. And as we see in the prayer notes, we Pray for Fort Rose Free Church. Lord, we thank you for the very recent settlement of uh, the ministry of Rory Stott. We pray for himself and his wife and their young child. Lord, we recognize the uh, strange times for them in particular, having moved here from Ayrshire and up to the Highlands. May they continue to settle, Lord. And we just pray for them as a ministry and as a congregation, as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are indeed together as the family of God serving you here in the highlands of Scotland. So, Lord our God, we do pray that you would be with us, be with the young ones as we speak to them just now. Lord, we pray that even in their young days, that they would put their trust in Jesus Christ. We ask it all in your precious and holy name. Amen. 
Well, let me take uh, this opportunity to speak to the young ones who are uh, tuning in. We are all part of a family, aren't we? Mums and dads and brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles, cousins. And you have your own first names, but what connects you to your own family is your surname. Perhaps the people in your household or some of your cousins, you have the same surname. It could be Mackenzie or Macaulay or Ross or Skinner, whatever your surname is. And maybe you know this already, but a lot of our Scottish surnames, they have a color attached to it. Or more particular than that, they have a tartan now, let me show you the best tartan. This is the McLeod tartan. That so happens to be my surname. And I've brought it with me to church today. This is the McLeod tartan. And it's got green and yellow and red. And I love to wear my McLeod kilt. I love to wear it to a wedding or to other special occasions. Because when I get to wear it, I get to show off that I am part of the McLeod family. But do you know what I love even more than being part of the McLeod family? Is that I am part of God's family. You've heard of Jesus going to the cross. That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to read about it in just a moment and then talk about it in the sermon. When Jesus was on the cross and some of the things that Jesus said, Jesus speaks about family. He talks to his mother even when he's on the cross. And you know, if we believe in Jesus, if we love him, and if we trust our whole life over to Jesus then he will take us to be part of his family. Let me share with you one verse from the Bible in the Gospel of John. To everyone that will receive Jesus and believe Jesus, he will make them children of God. So as much as I love being part of the McLeod family, what's most important is that we are part of God's family. Amen. Thank you, guys, for listening. We're going to read God's Word in that gospel, the gospel of John and chapter 19. We're going to read from verse 17. Let us hear the Word of God. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, 
and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Amen. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Our surnames, they bear witness to the families that we belong to. We're all connected by the blood that runs through our veins. With God's family, it's a little different. Out of pure love, the Father has chosen who will be part of his family. So many of you watching this today have been chosen by God and have accepted that invitation already. But that invitation is extended to you all this morning. Come into God's family where we're all connected by blood, the blood of Jesus that was shed at Calvary. It is into that scene that I want us to step today, a scene of darkness where the infuriated host of hell raged all around our Jesus. There was mocking and spitting and gambling and tempting. Sin was rising high at the top of Calvary. And yet, just as a beautiful rose might rise up in between the thorns, so a most beautiful company stand beneath Jesus at the cross. While others forsake him, this group of people, women, and one man, the beloved disciple, gathered around him. And now Jesus speaks to them. He says in verse 26, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. This is Jesus' third word from the cross, and it does three things. It looks back, it looks in, and it looks forward. It looks back, it looks in, and it looks forward. So let us begin then by looking back. And we need to go all the way back to the very first pages of Scripture, to the mother of all people, to Eve. She has a connection to the mother of Jesus. Both of their sons' blood was poured out. Righteous Abel, all the way back in the beginning of Genesis, was murdered by his brother. Jesus Christ, crucified on a tree. Abel's blood was shed as a token for the sin that had come into the world. Jesus' blood was shed to cover over the sin of the world. Abel's blood could only cry for vengeance and justice, but the blood of Jesus cries out that justice has been satisfied. So we have the mother of all the living and the mother of our Savior spanning the testaments and the death scenes of their sons. But to go just 30 years back from this scene at the cross, Mary and Joseph took baby Jesus and presented him at the temple. In the temple, they met this old man called Simeon, and Simeon had a prophecy. Simeon blesses the child, but he also then says to Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary is going to suffer because of this child. And so she does. I'm sure that she remembered 
that sword, when she felt the blade as Jesus died before her. For Mary, there were two dimensions that she had to learn in regards to her relationship to this child. She was not only observing her son be murdered, she was also witnessing her Savior pay the price for her sin. You know, everything that Jesus has done, including and perhaps especially his work on the cross, was out of submission to his Father in heaven. He said as much throughout his ministry, but especially when he left the upper room. He said, the world must learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. He submits to the Father's will and he places himself underneath the law of God. And the fifth commandment of that law, of the Ten Commandments, is this. Honor your father and your mother. Here Jesus is exemplifying that principle and honoring his mother in a remarkable way as he meets her and speaks to her at the very point of her need. But the reason that he honored his mother was because he had entire devotion to his Father in heaven. Even at the cross, he is a most glorious example of a son to his mother. You know, Mary was always a sinful mother. And Jesus was always a faultless son. He honored her flawlessly in a way that she could not mother him perfectly. However, no matter how many laws Mary broke as she tried to mother Jesus, every single mistake was being covered by her son, by her Savior, because of his submission to his heavenly Father. And that is true of you as well. Every single mistake that you have made as a mother, as a father, as a son, as a daughter, because of Jesus' submission to his heavenly Father, because of his blood satisfying justice, the way into this family is open to you. Looking back. But secondly, looking in. Jesus has prayed for the crowd's forgiveness in his first saying on the cross. And in a second, he granted salvation to a converted thief. But now he turns his attention to his own mother. Now, isn't it remarkable that he even thinks of Mary at all? You know, if this third saying of Jesus on the cross were omitted for whatever reason, not written down by John, then I'm not convinced that we would recognize that anything was missing. Yet the writer of Hebrews correctly states, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus couldn't take away Mary's pain of watching him die. That had to happen. But he acknowledged her and he gives her a gift. He looked into her heart. He knew what she needed and he offered consolation, comfort of another son, John, the beloved disciple to take care of her in a particular way. He said in verse 26, Dear woman, here is your son. How consoling it must have been to Mary's grieving heart 
the way in which Jesus should fix his attention upon her with all the pain, the pressure, and the powers of darkness, his voice, his peaceful look, focuses in on Mary. His words were as if to say to her, your son is not lost. He only returns to his father's side so that he may prepare a place for you, Mary. He enters into what she is experiencing and understands it in a way that she does not even understand it herself. Friends, that is what Jesus is able to do for you too. Whatever kept you up last night, whatever is distracting you this morning, our Jesus is able to come alongside you and to help you. Jesus went on to that cross to meet your greatest need to free you from your sin. Is your heart heavy with guilt? Then open it to Jesus. Is your heart afflicted with regret? Then open it to Jesus. Is your heart sore with sin? Then open it to Jesus. God has chosen you who would believe in his Son to be a part of his family. But before we move on, you may question, why does he call her woman? Why does he not use a more affectionate term like mother or even her name, Mary? Well, he does not forget that he is her son. He certainly does not forget that she is his sorely tried mother. But he meant for her to understand that from now on, their earthly connection must give way to a superior relationship. You see, Jesus was preparing her for the day that she would enter into paradise, not as a mother with a son, but as a daughter with a saviour. With loving forethought, the Lord desires to fill up Mary, to fill the void that his departure would leave in her life. And so he gives her a son to a sister, one in whom she might place her entire confidence and lean on in all her distresses, in all her cares, and with all her sorrows. Looking back, looking in, and thirdly, looking forward. The shoulders on whom Mary could now lean were those of John, the beloved disciple. Jesus had shown great compassion to his mother, as we have just seen in these words, but also to John in giving him this great responsibility. You see, it was not long since John, along with all the other disciples, abandoned Jesus and fled away from him when he was arrested and brought to trial. But now John is back where he belonged, at the feet of Jesus. Jesus turned to John and says, as we see in verse 27, here is your mother. John had been prepared for this task. Not only was he chosen as one of the twelve, he was also notably one of the three, the inner circle, the three disciples who was present at these significant moments during Jesus' ministry. He was there for the transfiguration. He was there at the raising of Jairus' daughter. He was there when Jesus cried out and prayed out in anguish, sweating drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane. But now, he was not part of the twelve. 
Now he's not part of the three. Now he is the one whom Jesus has called to give this most honorable of tasks. To care for his mother, to care for Mary, to be a son to her from this day forward. But a careful reading of the company, of who is here, will highlight to you that John's own mother was in this group. John's mother, Salome, she was at the cross that day too. She was, in fact, Mary's sister. John and Jesus, we believe, were cousins. We cannot underestimate the role that Salome plays throughout all of these events, silently agreeing to it all, accepting the charge that the Lord had given to her son, to take on another mother. Salome silently, spiritually acquiescing to all that Jesus was saying to her son. And in a sense, is that not what Christ always does? He's always forming new families. He always puts people together and the cross is what they have in common. Haven't we discovered that in the fellowship of the Lord's people? As we come to our church buildings, but even laterally, as we have met over the internet, and even as you've dialed into these Zoom calls or whatever it's been at the midweek meetings or the Sunday night fellowships, who are all these faces that you see on the screen? They are our brothers and our sisters in Christ Jesus. But you, too, may be looking and longing, perhaps, to be part of this family. Let me go out on a limb and suggest that maybe it feels like you are looking in through the window of this family, God's family, and you see them there all together. You see them in this church or you see them online just now. They're not perfect. Far from it. While they meet in this way. But you see that there's a love between them. You see that there's joy amongst them. You notice that there's peace around them. And the Lord sits at the head of their table but you know it's not yet complete. Something is missing. Someone has been invited to join this family and someone has not yet taken, taken their place. Your seat is waiting for you. Your invitation has been delivered. Will you come and be part of the family of God? Jesus said to John, here is your mother, and from that time on, the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus has an individual calling for John, and from that hour, he is willing to take it up. What must it have been like in that home, in the days, weeks, years that followed this day at the cross? I often did they reflect upon the Lord, John and Mary and Salome and other members of the family, how the conversation would have opened up about, about all the things that John saw as he was part of the twelve and even part of the three, being at the transfiguration, seeing that little girl being raised back to life, even seeing Jesus, Mary, Jesus sweated drops of blood. But what Mary could tell John of the things that only she knew, being the mother of our Lord. These are the best conversations that we can have in our fellowships and in our homes when we're talking about Jesus. You know, church, we all have a duty to fulfill. If you are part of God's family, 
You have this love for your brothers and sisters, don't you? It, but it cannot be merely words that we say. It must be deeds that we do. In the New Testament, what turned the world upside down? Well, was it not the testimony of how the church loved one another? We must take one another as John took Mary into her, his own home. Let us be united as one and go out into this world displaying the love that we have for the church because of the love that Jesus has for us. You know, a lot of our Scottish surnames, they begin with Mac, meaning son of. So, MacDonald, meaning son of Donald. Jesus wants to adopt you into his family. And he wants to change that name eternally. He wants to change it to sons and daughters of God. Come and be forgiven. Come and be saved. Come and be part of God's family. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we do thank you and we praise you that even in these moments of anguish that you were able to meet your own mother Mary's greatest need. That you were able to meet all of our greatest need of being on that cross and paying the penalty for our sin. Oh Lord, we pray that today that there would be invitations taken up and seats filled at the banqueting table. And Lord, we pray that many sons and daughters would be added to your family. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us conclude by singing together the hymn, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Let us sing to God's praise.
Now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you both now and forevermore. Amen.